Hello, my name is Tony Schmitz. Today I'll be presenting a brief tutorial on machining dynamics. Uh, this tutorial was prepared in collaboration with Scott Smith and we are both professors at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. There are a number of challenges associated with setting up a machining operation. These include appropriate path planning, fixturing when necessary, tooling selection, which may include balancing of the tooling and selection of the holder type. Coolant management and tool wear are often closely coupled. We must also ensure that the machine is sufficiently accurate to make the part in question. Contributors include the quasi-static positioning errors, dynamic positioning errors, and thermal errors, which depend on the thermal state of the machine. We also have to consider the tool and workpiece vibrations under stable cutting conditions. And then finally, chatter or unstable cutting conditions. Each of these issues affect the parameter selections. While each of these items is important, in this presentation we'll focus on the limitation imposed by chatter and how to avoid it. This graph shows a stability lobe diagram. On the vertical axis we have the axial depth of cut in milling. On the horizontal axis we have the commanded spindle speed. We see that the plot is divided into two regions. A gray region which indicates axial depth spindle speed combinations that will give chatter and a white region which identifies axial depth spindle speed combinations that will lead to stable operation. We see that there are particular spindle speeds where increased axial depths of cut can be achieved. These are identified as the best speeds on the diagram and show the peaks of the stability lobes. This diagram represents some counterintuitive results. The first is that increased spindle speed can be used to eliminate chatter. The second is that feed rate is not the primary adjustment. And finally, these best speeds probably do not correspond to the handbook values. The reason these best speeds do not necessarily correspond to the handbook values for cutting speed are that the handbook values tend to be conservative and there are different dynamics between the tool wear test setup used to identify the handbook values and your machine, um, which the dynamics there identify these best spindle speeds. However, these handbook values can be used to bound the highest cutting speed. So the question we may ask is, what do I need in order to generate a stability lobe diagram? There are two requirements for generating a stability lobe diagram. The first is the frequency response function at the end of the cutting tool. This describes the dynamic response or vibration behavior of the tool, holder, spindle, machine tool. The second is a model of the cutting force. This is generally described using something referred to as cutting force coefficients, which relate the area of the chip being removed to the force components. Given these two items of information, a stability lobe diagram can then be generated. Let's talk more about frequency response functions. In the top figure, we see a ruler which is clamped on the edge of a table. If we deflect it and release it, we see that it vibrates, and it vibrates at some particular frequency. For the lower ruler, if we deflect it and release it, it vibrates at its own frequency again, but this time a higher frequency. A frequency response function describes these natural frequencies and the stiffness of the beam. In reality, our ruler is vibrating at multiple natural frequencies simultaneously, and each one of these natural frequencies has a particular shape associated with it, or mode shape. In the top left figure, we see the first natural frequency for this clamped ruler. In the top right figure, we see the second natural frequency, and we see that it has a different shape as it deflects. In the bottom figure, we see the third natural frequency vibration and its corresponding mode shape. These multiple natural frequencies and mode shapes are present in every structure, including our tool, holder, spindle, machine combination. And this information is captured in frequency response functions. 
We know that after some time the ruler will stop vibrating. This is because all physical systems include some damping. Damping refers to the leakage of the input energy into the vibrating system. In other words, not all of the input energy serves to cause motion. Some of it is dissipated in other ways, particularly heat. Damping is often dim dissipated at interfaces, for example, between the holder and tool or between the holder and spindle. A frequency response function also characterizes the system damping. So the question we may ask at this point is, what does a frequency response function look like? Our long flexible ruler is shown on the left. Beneath it are the real and imaginary parts of its frequency response function, where real and imaginary do not indicate existence or non-existence, they're just names for the parts of the frequency response function. On the right, we see the shorter, stiffer ruler. Its frequency response function is also shown below it. The difference between these two is that the shorter ruler has a higher natural frequency and a smaller amplitude because it is stiffer. More damping would also reduce the amplitude and one thing we observe in measured frequency response functions is that multiple natural frequencies will give multiple peaks. As we mentioned before, in order to generate a stability load diagram we need to measure the frequency response function at the tool point or the free end of the cutting tool. We perform this operation by exciting the tool with a small hammer, a modal hammer, and recording the response with a transducer such as an accelerometer. This measured frequency response function is specific to the tool, holder, spindle, machine combination selected for testing. It's important to note that if you change the overhang or stick out length of the tool, the frequency response function changes. Likewise, if you put the same tool holder combination in another spindle, the FRF may change if that spindle dynamics are not the same as the original spindle dynamics. We also require the force model in order to develop a stability load diagram. This force model is described in terms of cutting force coefficients. Some important notes about cutting force coefficients is that they are not material properties but rather approximately represent the chip formation as a lumped parameter. Also, tabulated values are generally available. Finally, cutting force coefficients may be determined experimentally by measuring the cutting force for known cutting conditions using a cutting force dynamometer. Some representative values of cutting force coefficients for common materials are shown in the table. Let's discuss the equipment that's necessary in order to perform a frequency response function measurement. First, we need a mechanism to input a known force across a wide frequency range. Second, we need a transducer in order to measure the vibration. And third, we require a dynamic signal analyzer that records the force and vibration inputs and converts these into the desired frequency response function. There are two main mechanisms for force input to a dynamic system. The first is the impact or modal hammer. In this case, a force transducer in a metal, plastic, or rubber tip is used to measure the force input during a light hammer strike. This is the most popular choice for tool holder testing. The second mechanism is a shaker. In this case, an armature is attached to the structure of interest through a stinger or a slender rod and then motion of the armature imparts a force to the structure. A load cell is incorporated in order to measure the input force. In order to record the vibration response due to the force input, two main methods are used. Accelerometers are the most common choice. This is a contact type transducer um, that is attached to the structure at the point of interest. For accelerometers, we would like the mass to be small so that it doesn't affect the structure that we are measuring. Capacitance probes and laser vibrometers 
offer non-contact vibration measurement solutions, but their setup is more complicated and so they're not, as, they're not used as commonly for tool point frequency response function measurements. In order to measure a frequency response function, we first measure the accelerometer or vibration and hammer or force signals um, using a signal analyzer. As shown in the schematic, there are amplifiers which amplify the acceleration and force signals. Then an analog to digital conversion step is used to sample the data. This time domain data is converted into the frequency domain using the Fourier transform or FFT and then those two signals are divided in order to give the frequency response function. Frequency response function measurement kits that includes the required hardware and software are available commercially. To summarize, we've learned that stability lobe diagrams can be used at the process planning stage in order to select chatter-free machining conditions. The requirements are the tool point frequency response function and the cutting force model through cutting force coefficients. Given this information and the stability lobe diagram, you can increase material removal rates and reduce the process prove out times for new machining operations. Thank you for watching and please feel free to contact me if you have additional questions.